All right. Hello, Michael. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? I can we hear you. Have you. you. Hear me? Yes. Nice. Thank you for joining us. No problem. Thank you. Let me um, see how everything's looking here. Yeah. Just, sorry, I didn't get everything set up yet. No, you're fine. We have plenty of time. All right. All right. Okay, we're going to start with questions. We'll take as many questions as we have within um, the allotted time. And um, to kick us off with questions, we're going to go ahead and start with Mark Garrow at PRN. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Hope yeah, you had a good off season. Doing good. How are uh, you? Doing well. I appreciate good. you asking that. Uh, as you look at the competitive balance of this series, now we have a number of new teams, a lot of things shifting. Uh, where do you feel Front Row Motorsports fits in all of this? Well, I think that, you know, Front Row for us last year, we, we feel like we made a pretty big gain just from overall just competitiveness and speed in our race cars. And, you know, with the with the quote unquote um, development freeze that NASCAR has put into place, um, we feel like that's really helped us a lot just because you know, in years past, you, you would kind of start the year off and, and you feel like you're somewhat close, but then by the middle to the end of the year, you just felt like you've lost some to the competition where last year we felt like we were able to keep up quite a bit um, throughout the year. And then going into the off season, knowing that there's not big fundamental changes, you know, not only for us, but also for our competitors, you know, that, that allows us to work on the details and make our race cars a little bit lighter and a little bit faster and not having to develop new clips and, and new parts and pieces and, you know, doing all those things that, you know, we sort of fall behind as a, you know, medium sized organization. So I feel like that we have the potential to be more competitive this year than even we were, we were last year. Um, but you just never know until you hit the racetrack. Where do you feel you are as a driver, as, you know, because you get to a point in your career where experience, you know, matches up with, you know, you're kind of in the prime physically, uh, mentally. And then, of course, you combine it with all the experience now that you have. Where, where do you feel you are along that trail? You are, are you at the right intersection uh, right now or a prime intersection in your career? Yeah, I definitely think so. You know, you feel that way. I'm sure if you asked everybody, they probably feel that way, right? Um, but I do believe that experience is such a big part of this sport. Um, and you know, with, with my background in open wheel cars and sports cars, when I was, you know, young, it was just, just go as hard as you can and as fast as you can and, and use the downforce and utilize the brakes and just, you know, you could push yourself and take chances to find speed where in, in our cup cars, you really have to be smooth and you have to be methodical and you can't overwork the tire and you, you really have to understand the car well and, and understand the tracks and the tires and, and, you know, as the lines change and as you get into long runs. And uh, so experience is such a big part of our sport that I feel like I'm in a good spot with that, you know, and more than anything is just as I'm getting more confident and comfortable and have that experience, our race cars are getting faster at the same time. And, and so that, that, you know, that combination is, has been good for me for sure. You talked a moment ago about being a, a mid-level team. Do you think that the next gen car is going to kind of even things up and help mid-level teams maybe be able to take the next step up? Yeah, I, I definitely hope so. I, I feel like it has the potential to do that. Um, I think if you look at just in, in general, th the top teams, I feel like will always be the top teams. You know, there's there's several of them in our in our sport. But it, even if you just take the IndyCar model of, you know, a standardized chassis and standardized you know body parts and things like that, you still have your elite team and Team Penske and Ganassi. Those teams are still at the top. Um, but the thing that, you know, gives me hope with this next gen car is that Dale Coyne with Sebastian Bourdais at the right track at the right day they hit the setup right they can win a race where right now I don't feel like a mid-level team can win a race and even at a road course or a super speedway and so I do feel like that that the next gen car will will level that playing field I think your top teams will always be your top teams but you know on a given day if you hit it right and and everything goes your way you should have the opportunity and the potential to win and so hopefully the next gen car will provide that. 
And my final question, what's life like as a mid-level team trying to fight the good fight, um, trying to take on the big dogs with maybe not as big a dollars as they have? Yeah, it, you know, for me, it's a lot of fun. I mean, because, you know, on those good days where, where you sneak out a top 10 or a top five, you really feel like you've accomplished something. And then on those days, you know, you always have ups and downs on those days where you run 20 something, you know, you can kind of brush it off and, and get ready for the next week. And um, but just seeing the steady progression for us, I think, is what is the motivator. I mean, last year, um, you know, you always have high expectations. But when you actually go out there and perform, you know, we started to feel like, hey, we can do this. Like we we can run a 15th every week and we can beat two or three of these big teams. Um, and do it on a weekly basis. And, and so that was a lot of fun and, and very rewarding. And, and hopefully we can keep that going, you know, into 2021 as well. Thank you. Have a great, great season. Thanks. Okay, we're going to take our next question from Dustin Albino. Go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, Michael, how are you? I'm doing great, Dustin. How are you? Good. Hey, so Anthony was just on. Obviously, he's your third teammate in the last three years with Front Row Motorsports. I know you were, you know, your off track relationship with David, you guys are really close, but how tough is it adjusting to the new blood coming in the doors at Front Row over the last couple of years? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've had a, a, a rookie with me in the last uh, three years, you know, with Matt Tiff and then John Hunter and now um, Anthony. So, um, you know, it, I feel like it's been different this time with Anthony. Um, I'm not really sure why. I think that, you know, just his personality, um, his eagerness to learn, and, and really his greenness, you know, just being a legit rookie um, with not a lot of experience. It's, um, you know, it's it's been fun to, to help him and work with him. And, um, you know, we've right before we, we did this, I was just talking to him about, you know, some of the stuff that we got going on this week with simulation and, and just working through, you know, things that he needs to think about and, and things that don't, you know, pop up until you get into the race and it's too late. So uh, it's fun to, to help guys, you know, be able to shorten that learning curve. And, and really with him, it's been pretty easy just because, like I said, he's so eager to learn, um, easy to get along with and very respectful and humble. And um, so it's been fun. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take our next question. From, let's see here, we'll go with Kelvin with RS and Trackside. Go ahead, Kelvin. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, hey, Michael. So congratulations on Love's rejoining. I heard they uh, extended with you, so congrats on that. What has that relationship meant to you for them to keep signing on with you? Well, I think that, you know, there's, there's kind of not two sides to it, but for Front Row, you know, Love's has been, you know, just a – essential partner, a backbone of the program. I mean, the 34 car and, and the 38 when David Gillen was in it, you know, has, has had loves as a primary for majority, you know, over half the races, you know, since they've come onto the team. And so just to have a, a core partner like that is, is super um, important, you know, for the growth of our race team and just the progression of our race team. And, you know, for me personally, um, to come to front row and get to drive the loves car, you know, I took that as like a, um, just a, a badge of honor. Um, you know, when I came to the team as a rookie and got to drive the Loves car, I really felt that pressure of, you know, I'm carrying the, the Loves brand and the, and the banner for the race team and uh, to grow that relationship with them and, and to continue to represent them. And then for them to be such a big brand, you know, they're, they're an iconic American brand. They're, they're a family brand. And, you know, we're, we're a mid-level team. And so it's an honor to have, have a partner like that, that has just been, you know, so, um, just the backbone of this organization. So it's, it's great to continue that and hopefully we'll get to continue it for another 10 years. Hopefully that one, one more, just quick one with all the changes to the NASCAR schedule this year, you got six new changes. You got the road course at Indy, you've got Nashville super speedway. You have the Bristol dirt race. Uh, Bristol is one of your better tracks when it's on pavement. How are you feeling about <laughs> the changes made to the NASCAR schedule? Yeah, I love the changes. Um, you know, you mentioned the Bristol Dirt one. That's probably my least uh, favorite one out of all of them. But 
you know, obviously with road courses, um, you know, really looking forward to getting to Road America and to, you know, Austin, Dakota and then Indianapolis. Um, and then now we have Daytona road course as well again. So excited about our schedule, going to be a lot of fun and, and some great opportunities for us. Um, you, you know, Bristol dirt is, is definitely going to be a tough one for me with not a lot of dirt, you know, racing background, but I'm um, doing my homework and putting in the time and, and it's an opportunity race, just like Bristol always is. Um, but, you know, we did definitely lose a couple of good tracks that typically you wouldn't look at and, and circle those as good tracks. And Bristol was one of them and, and Indianapolis was one of them as well. You know, obviously the road course would be a lot of fun and looking forward to that. But um, yeah, so the schedule and, you know, for me, it's just exciting to mix it up and to have new tracks. And I feel like the road courses are great opportunities for us. So we're definitely looking forward to this season. Thanks, Michael. Good luck next week. Thanks. Okay, we're going to take our next question from Ashley McCubbin. Go ahead, Ashley. Michael, I'm looking at your career to date. If you could go back a couple of years and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, um, you know, I think the biggest thing that I would, you know, you, you can't always hit the reset button, but if I could go back to my rookie season, I would just enjoy it a lot more. Um, you know, I had so much pressure that I put on myself and, you know, and out, outward, you know, pressure as well from team and sponsors and manufacturer, but, you know, just in particular myself, I just felt like I needed to, you know, achieve and probably expected more out of myself than, you know, was really fair for a rookie coming into the, the cup series. Um, and so I didn't enjoy that first year as much as I, I should have, you know, going to Daytona for the first time or going to Indianapolis to the Brickyard for the first time and uh, experiencing that. I, I didn't take in the experience because I was so consumed with, you know, the result and performance, which, which is a part of our sport. But I didn't take the time to really take in this, you know, how cool it is to be one of 40 and to, you know, come to these iconic racetracks and you know, run your first Bristol night race and, and all those things. So uh, just enjoy the journey a lot more and, and take it all in. And additionally, a lot of focus has been put on uh, safety innovations, you know, returning back to Daytona after Ryan Newman's crash last year. You had a big crash yourself a couple of years ago there at Texas Motor Speedway. What stood out for you from that? Yeah, I think that any time that you have, um, you know, a, a big crash where you know, obviously the, the car takes a lot of damage. You learn from it. NASCAR's done a great job with their with their R&D center and just their whole team that goes back and analyzes all the data and all the video and, and looks at the cars and measures everything and see what moves and see what didn't move and see what could be stronger and, and what needs to be weaker so that it does move. And um, obviously every year, you know, you learn a great amount. And, and unfortunately, those big crashes are sort of what helps you get to that next level and and with you know with Ryan's crash at the Daytona 500 last year you know they were able to learn a few things that um, you know that went into our cars at the end of last year and then starting this year so you're always learning from those those uh, tough experiences and and always getting safer and safer but you know I feel incredibly safe driving our race cars you you, you know that there's always a danger but um, I just feel like you know our cars are are incredibly safe right now. Thank you. Okay, we will take our next question from Jamel Hawkins. Go ahead, Jamel. Thank you. Um, Michael, since your first day at Front Row Motorsports, uh, how have you seen the team change from your first day until how it is now? Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely changed a tremendous amount. I think that um, you know, probably the most important part of any race team or any organization or, or company or team is, is, is people. And so over the, you know, the last, you know, four or five years, you know, there's been some changes in personnel and, um, we've been able to bring on a few key people and move, move people from one role to the next. And that's really helped with just overall performance and just producing better race cars and faster race cars. Um, and I would say the mentality has changed quite a bit since the first day here. You know, I think that that first year it was about, um, you know, building a, a race car that's going to make it through the race and it's going to last and be competitive. And the goals weren't super high. 
Um, and I feel like as we have achieved a little bit more and more every year that that bar keeps getting raised and everybody stepped up and, and last year was, you know, evidence of that. And, and so I feel like we're finally in a, a spot where, where we're able to really compete and compete at a high level. And I think that everybody's bought in at the shop. It's not just about, you know, making sure this doesn't fall off, but it's about making this lighter and faster and, and more performance. And, and so that, that whole mentality has changed throughout the you know, entire company, which is great. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take our next question from Tucker White. Go ahead, Tucker. Was expecting it to go already, yeah. Uh, and damn it, Michael, as we've seen over the last few seasons, especially with last season, the driver who performs best over the course of the season doesn't necessarily make the championship race or even win the title. And given how much the playoffs are now weighted on just ran well, luck heavy or random luck, whatever term you want to use, uh, how exactly are the playoffs a good method of determining a champion, especially when leagues like IndyCar and Formula One decide their champion be a season long format? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, I can see both sides of the, you know, the conversation on, on the playoffs and, and the, the points and the champion and all that. You know, I do feel like um, that there's opportunities inside the playoffs, even if you have a bad race to kind of redeem yourself and get to the next round. Um, and so I feel like it's usually the top, you know, two or three teams that are in the final four. And you, and you might have somebody that, that slides in that wouldn't typically be there, but it's usually only one. Um, so I, I feel like as far as, you know, seeing who, what's the best teams going head to head, you know, I feel like we, we get there every year. Um, I, I would say that there's probably very few years where you look at it and you go, man, that, that's somebody that should have won the championship that, that didn't, you know, make it. Um, I feel like there's opportunity on the flip side of that, you know, formula one, the, the driver points were over with four races to go. And so that's not very fun. Uh, knowing that Lewis Hamilton's already won before you even throw the green flag with three races ago isn't very entertaining for the fans. So I do feel like there's an element that is cool about the playoffs and, and, you know, getting to that final round. Um, but I'm a little bit of a purist to where, you know, whoever scores the most points in the year should win. So uh, I can see both sides of the conversation, but um, would love to make the playoffs and be in that conversation. But um, from the outside, which I haven't been in the playoffs, it is fun and entertaining to watch and, and see it all play out. All right. Thank you. Okay. We're going to take our next question from Bob Pockers. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Michael, uh, you had one of your best years last year with this team. Do you look at it like you could potentially point your way into the playoffs or do you still, or do you feel like gosh, got win and most likely super speedway or road course to get in? You know, I, I mean, Bob, to be completely honest with you I still feel like we would have to win I think it would be tough to point point in um but at, at times last year we felt the potential that we could um you know but it only takes one or two you know shifts you know whether that be somebody win a race that was behind you in points or around you or somebody score a lot of stage points um to really you know build a big gap so I do think it's possible. I do feel like we left a lot of points on the table last year at some key events. Um, you know, like you said, super speedways typically are our bread and butter for points. And last year we didn't score that many at super speedways. Um, and so those are strong races for us, but last year we didn't execute well. Um, so I feel like if we, if we execute well at those racetracks where we can run top 10, top five, there's an outside chance that we could point our way in, but the, the goal and the focus is still to win a race and put ourselves in position to win a race. And, um, and, and, you know, throughout the year score as many points as we can. So, you know, last year was a good step. Felt like we were close to that top 20, but to make it to, you know, the top 16 is going to take a lot more points. And what does the introduction of the new car in 2022 like, how does that impact your team compared to other teams? Do you feel like it tightens the gap or do you feel like the other teams are deep enough that they'll still work on the current car at a point where maybe you guys are, guys are just scrapping to build, starting to build the next gen car? Yeah, I think that um, as far as, are you asking more about the overall performance of 2021, knowing that 2022 is coming? 
Yeah, I'm I'm yeah. curious about depth and what you know and what that means as far as like do you think the the big teams are not going to develop this car anymore because they're going to focus on the next gen and so mm-hmm. then therefore you know there's no like gap right. widening during the yeah. season. No, I don't think that. I think the top teams are going to spend everything they have to try to win races and win the championship just like they always do. I think there's elements um, that will help us be a little bit closer in regards to competition. Probably more than anything is just what NASCAR's done with just the development freeze. That that helps us, I feel like, a tremendous amount. Um, just because the teams aren't – they're always making gains, but they're not making huge gains um, – in, in changing the structure of the race car and just fundamental parts and pieces. And, you know, every time you find a little bit of a gain over the last two or three years, it's it's been all the suspension has to be updated because it all goes together and all the shape and design and to middle and there's a whole process to it. And with that being frozen, I feel like that that's helped us a lot. Um, but the top teams are still going to spend, you know, a lot of money to try to win races and championships. And, you know, I do feel like there might be, um, you know, long-term adjustments in the sport, knowing that 2022 car is coming, but I don't feel like that'll give us a, a greater chance of, of, you know, pointing in or, or winning a race. I feel like it's, it's the same. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to take our next question from Marty with ROC Sports, and then Casey, you can go after Marty. Thanks, Amanda. Kind of just as a follow-up to that one guy from RS and Trackside, Kelvin's question. Um, with the road courses we've got on the schedule, do you think you could be like a big underdog at that chunk of the season? Yeah, I do. I feel like, you know, last year we, we had some strong road courses. Um, I think Daytona Road Course was probably our best speed-wise. Probably had a top five car and, and ended up finishing 10th with it. So we need to be in that top five in speed to really put ourselves in position to, you know, get a a caution at the right time, strategy at the right time, you know, get to the front, have something work out to where you could win a race. But I feel like consistently we can run in that top 10 at those road courses, pretty much all of them and, and knocking on the door of top five, which puts us in the conversation, but we still need to find a little bit more um, to, to really surprise and, and to shock people. And I think that it's gotten harder you know, over the years, I've just seen that, you know, the, the cup regulars are getting better, but also too the disparity and, and performance between the cars is, is even greater at the road courses than, than what it was early on. I felt like the driver, you know, early in my career made a bigger, you know, splash at those road courses than the equipment. And it seems like the equipment now is, is getting to the point, just like at the other racetracks where, you can have an average driver in a great car and, and have a great finish, but not vice versa. Thanks for your time, man. Have a great speed weeks. Thanks. Go ahead, Casey. All right. Thanks, Marissa. Um, hey, Michael, how are you, bud? I'm doing good, Casey. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, so, of course, you know, this is, uh, I think this is year four for you at Front Row. Um, you're, back with, um, you're back with your crew chief, Drew Blickens Durfer, again. So what's this, uh, how, how have you guys kind of, have you guys gotten used to each other now that you're in, I think this is year three or four. I'm not quite sure. I, I, this is, I think year two with year three. Yep. This will be year three with Drew and I. Um, yeah, Drew is a tremendous asset um, to the 34 car and to front row. And, and he's a big part of um, just the performance increase that we've seen and the gains that we've made. And so relationship wise, you know, Drew and I hit it off pretty good right out of the gate because we were both driven by, um, you know, just performance and getting the most out of our race cars and our race weekends. And so um, that that was pretty easy. Um, but now that we've, you know, spent a few seasons together, we definitely understand each other a lot better. And, and he does a great job extracting um, what he needs out of me and vice versa. And I would say the best um, part of Drew and I's relationship is we can be very honest and um, we can have heated conversations and we can disagree and we can yell at each other and um, and shortly get over that and, and figure out what we got to do to be better. And I like the intensity that he has and I think that um, he would probably say the same about me. Um, so, you know, with both of us being fairly intense, there's times where we, uh, we go at it a little bit, but um, I feel like we've We've done a great job of just 
um, together working really hard to to get the right people in place on our race team and to get the most out of our our race cars and the weekend and he does a great job with strategy um so yeah he's definitely a, a big part of um you know the success that we've had here and and for me is a is a critical part moving forward all right thanks thank you Okay, we're gonna take our next question from Kelvin. Did you have another question? Okay, any final questions for Michael? Yes, I have one. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Michael, following up on, on some of this road course stuff, Chase Elliott's been unbeatable uh, lately. Yeah. I mean, just not, you know, even kind of close. It's just like, yeah. hello, goodbye, you know, kind, yeah. of, kind of deal. I mean, what's your thoughts on that, that somebody at this level with as many good teams and as many good drivers um, can sort of at this point clearly be at least a little heads up on everybody? Yeah, they, they definitely are, you know, a leg up on everybody. I mean, that's pretty evident. Um, but Chase has done a great job of executing and getting the most out of it. And then if you just look at Daytona road course last year, I mean, Denny Hamlin, I think had similar speed was right there with him, pressuring him, and he just never made a mistake and never gave him an opportunity. And so um, it's pretty amazing that he's as strong as he is in consistently making it happen. Um, and probably the most impressive thing that I've seen is his ability to drive back through the field when they get behind. Typically at a road course, once you lose that track position and you get buried in the field, it, it's hard to march your way. You know, it's one thing to get back in the top 10. It's really difficult to get back in the top five, but to get all the way back to the lead, like he's done two or three times from, you know, whether it be penalties or mistakes in Charlotte, you know, he got into the, the tire barrier there in turn one, went all the way to the back, got to the front. You know, last year, strategy wise, you know, they, they went back to 20th, was able to drive to the front. And so I feel like, you know, his ability to uh, get back through the field has probably been the most impressive thing. And, you know, we're all paying attention for sure. And, and you know, looking at, at data and watching video and seeing if there's, you know, if there's anything that, that is glaring that sticks out that he's doing differently than everybody else. And I think they've just had fast race cars and he's done a good job of executing. And, and um, but hopefully we can, we can put a dent in there and, and close the gap and, and make some challenges. Kyle Busch kind of joked last year, I think it was at the Roval where he said Chase drove by him. He said, okay, now I'm going to figure out what this guy's doing. And he said Chase was gone <laughs> before he yeah. could really figure it out. Uh, I, when you look at this stuff, I mean, do you see something in his driving style? Do you see, uh, you know, little nuances that just kind of give him, once you add them all up together, give him that kind of ability to stay out front or drive from back to front? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, without giving that all away, I, I've spent a lot of time this off season looking at it and trying to understand it and, and really, you know, wrap your head around what's making him as fast as he is and as good as he is right now at those places. So, yeah, I think there are things that he's doing and I think that there's things that their team is doing that is giving them a little bit of an advantage and, and he's uh, making the most of those opportunities. Um, and I think there are some things to learn for sure. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll try to apply them on, uh, you know, that second week when we go to Daytona road course and we'll see and, and see if we can close the gap a little bit, but, um, it's been really impressive what he's been able to do for sure. So you're not even going to give us a, a small hint of one little thing that you spotted, uh, that would, that gives them the advantage. Um, yeah, he, he makes up a lot of time in the break zone and he's very meticulous with his line and uh, he doesn't deviate very much. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate yeah. it. All right, Michael, we appreciate your time. And I uh, thank thanks. you for, um, you know, being with us for the last 30 minutes or so. And we uh, wish you the best of luck in the Daytona 500. Thank you, guys. Appreciate y'all coming on.